Okay, so here's a piece of information that they discovered. If they were looking at a spectrum of sunlight, once they got decent enough equipment, they found out that it was not continuous. There were these missing frequencies. The dark lines are places where the frequency just simply wasn't being represented at all. Okay, why are those wavelengths missing? Those were called Fraunhofer lines because that's the fellow who had come up with the device that measured the exact wavelength of those lines and would display them so beautifully so that you could see them easily. These are, we now know, atomic absorption spectra. These Fraunhofer lines are the patterns of lines that are produced when you take a continuous spectra of radiation and you pass it through a gas or multiple gases. Those gases will absorb certain radiation lines and not others and then you will have something that looks like this. Now this is sunlight. Oh so this is through the whole atmosphere. This is all the different types of gases that are in the atmosphere taking their sections out. At the same time, Bunsen, yes, the guy who invented the Bunsen burner, and Kirchhoff, who you might have heard of if you do some electrical circuitry stuff, they were also working on spectroscopy, but they were doing emission spectroscopy instead of absorption. They were looking at vaporizing elements and seeing what types of lines they produced. So it turns out those were exactly the opposite of the Fraunhofer. You would get a few bright lines on a dark background, but again, you could figure out exactly what energies those were and what, when they decided to compare notes, what they discovered was that the emission spectrum of hydrogen and the absorption spectrum of hydrogen are exact opposites. So that is how they could come to the conclusion that, oh, if I figure out what a hydrogen spectrum looks like, that accounts for some of the dark lines that we would see coming from sunlight through the atmosphere, we could say, oh, there must be some hydrogen in our atmosphere because these lines are missing. Now you can see there are not very many here in the visible range. You only see four, but certainly hydrogen isn't the only thing in our atmosphere. Max Planck is the one who really started the development of quantum theory. He said, after looking at many, many things, that radiant energy, even though the source might seem like it would produce continuous patterns, is never truly continuous. That's Planck's constant. He got named after him because of the fact that he's starting all this. He said that all electromagnetic energy would be produced in integral multiples of an elementary unit. Oh. This is where you get that Planck's constant, and that's part of the reason why it's such a small number, 10 to the negative 34. You're just not even going to notice that that isn't continuous under most circumstances. Now, this little step, this multiple, this unit, you can call that a quantum, the smallest discrete quantity of a particular form of energy discrete as opposed to continuous, a little stepping stone, so to speak. Planck's constant, again, like I mentioned, 10 to the negative 34, tiny, tiny, tiny. Now, if you combine the two equations that we had from before, we had lambda times nu equals c and e equals h nu. If you combine those two, you can come up with this equation so that you can see that the energy could also be related to Planck's constant, the speed of light, and the wavelength. You can derive this equation from the other two. That's the important point. We come up with the idea of photons. Instead of just saying that light is a wave, we can think of it as a packet, a quantum of electromagnetic radiation or energy. So the big idea, quantization. The light waves are going to deliver a certain amount of energy depending on their frequency or their wavelength. You can calculate it either way. And this packet of energy, this photon, is why you can also look at light as a particle and not just as a wave. It results in some interesting things for us in chemistry as well because that has been, with what we've said so far, there's been a lot of physics and not much chemistry. But the electrons in an atom, 
They are already in that atom. They are not free. They are bound. They change what energy they have their level of energy in steps, discrete steps. Now those steps are not necessarily the same size. In fact, they're almost never the same size, but let's look at it a little more. So we're gonna pretend we're electrons. Some of this, I have to act it out, so you're gonna to have to watch. <laughs> so you, you are an electron. You are uh, bound to an atom. What does that mean? That means you're in a potential energy well. You are maybe as low as you can go. If you're as low as you can go, you are in the ground state. Now, that doesn't mean that every electron that is bound in an atom is in the ground state because there's only so much room down there. So you might be a little higher, but you're still not up here where you could be a free electron and escape the atom altogether. Okay? So if you're down there at the ground state, you're as low as you can go. You can become excited by absorbing energy from a light beam, for example, and then you'll be up at a higher energy state. But remember, free was still clear up here. I'm still not free. I'm up at a higher level, energy level than I was. I have more energy, but I don't have enough to leave. You might have enough to leave, but in this case, I don't. You don't see me flying off like Superman, right? But if I were to get a little more energy, I might be able to get away. So if I'm at this energy level, which is a little higher than the ground level, right, I won't need as much energy in order to escape and become a free electron. 